Hello, good afternoon. Thanks. Um, I'm Mary Beth Albright. I'm a correspondent and editor at the Washington Post. And I'm really thrilled to be here today because I feel that Do Nothing is a book for our time right now. I don't know if you were just at the last session about anxiety, but this is like, it's a very good through line that we're working on right now. Um, and it gave me, reading Do Nothing gave me layers of appreciation for this basic human truth that our speaker, Celeste Headley, is going to tell us about today, which is that as humans, we have an innate need to create and to make things better. And at the same time, as humans, we have an innate need to rest. And if we don't have a society that supports that, we really need to navigate those waters ourselves. And that is part of our work as humans. And as you can see, as we talked about, Celeste Headley is here today with us. I'm a little fangirling right now over her um, to talk about the book and then to take a lot of your questions. Um, so get those ready. Uh, Celeste Headley is an award-winning journalist with 20 years in public radio, including as the anchor of Tell Me More, Talk of the Nation, All Things Considered, 1A, and Weekend Edition. Never heard of any of those, right? It's like all the greats. She is the best-selling author of We Need to Talk, How to Have Conversations That Matter, and to that point, her TED Talk, her TEDx talk on having better conversations now has more than 34 million views, uh, including one of mine just this morning. I watched it again, and it's, it, it really is fantastic. It's one of those talks that ends, and you're like, it's finished? How could that have possibly been 20 minutes? Um, so she's, he, she's helped a lot of people with the book Do Nothing and with that TEDx talk, and she's here today to continue uh, to do that. So Celeste, come on up and tell us how to live. Hello. Um, every time I talk, there's always a lot of questions. So I'm only going to talk for 10 minutes, and then we're going to take your questions. Um, I find that there's a, often a lot of pushback on do nothing. Um, and I want to talk about why I believe that there is resistance. But first, let me begin with why this book was written. Because I actually, when I began researching for do nothing, I, I wasn't writing a book. I was writing a different book entirely. Um, but I myself was exhausted. <laughs> um, I was worn out. I was overwhelmed. I was frustrated. I was not happy. And the thing of it was is that I had finally reached, finally reached financial stability. Like my very first book advance, I paid off my student loans. And um, I had finally reached a point where I had gotten the kind of success where I could, you know, feel, I guess, stable. Um, and I, I had my whole life thought about that moment, what that would be like. And I had all these, you know, <laughs> thoughts that, you know, when I pay off all my debts, I'm going to go to New Zealand and I'm going to learn how to salsa dance. Um, and instead, I was just working more um, all the time. And so then, so then I thought, well, it must be my boss. Um, so I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to become self-employed. And anyone who's ever been self-employed knows how stupid that decision was. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that even when I had control over my own schedule, it got exponentially worse. Uh, and at one point, I got so sick. And I'm a very healthy person. Um, but I got so sick, I was out for like 10 days. Like, out. And uh, so that's when I started the research. I was like, something, something core <laughs> is wrong. Um, and I need to figure it out. And so I thought that the answer was going to be technology. Um, I thought that, you know, I was just addicted to my smartphone and my smartwatch and my tablet and my laptop and my Twitter. And that once I got that under control, it would solve things. And I actually became a Luddite for over a month. And I just, I got one of those dumb phones um, that, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Um, and I let go of my technology and it, I mean, it, it did help a little bit. I mean, quitting Facebook was revolutionary, um, but it, it, that wasn't the core of the problem. So I went and sought out the best librarians I could find, and I was like, I need to start peeling back the layers of this onion. Um, and I kept going back and back in history to try to figure out why I felt guilty any time I sat down at the, on the couch to watch a movie and didn't also check my email. Um, 
why that made me feel bad about myself. And um, the, the aha moment for me was when I realized that before the Industrial Revolution and for most of Homo sapiens 300,000 years on this planet, we lived a very different way. For most of our human history, we lived one way. <laughs> and then the Industrial Revolution came along and changed almost everything. I mean, I don't know what your education was like in high school. Mine was very good, and yet I really don't think they impressed upon me how much the Industrial Revolution changed. Up until like 1920, 1930, the majority of people on the planet lived in the country. It wasn't until very recently, like less than 100 years ago, that people really began to live in cities. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that time began to equal money. That was when that all started. Um, in other words, if it's, you know, 1650 and your wagon wheel breaks, you go to the person who makes wagon wheels and they make you a wagon wheel and then that job is done. But when you have a factory, you just keep making wagon wheels. <laughs> it, it never stops, which means A, your work is never done, but also it means it's not how well you do work, it's how long you spend doing it. So we had, if you go back and look at some, of, even some of the buildings that surround us and look at the craftsmanship of the way some of these buildings were made, the carvings in the wood and the mosaics and the tile, um, we can't do that today because it's too expensive. Why? Because we don't have a craftsman class anymore. Because when factories came around, that person who did mosaics for a living couldn't outbid the person who's just making tile after tile after tile, and so they gave up their tools, meaning they no longer even owned their own tools to make a living, and went into a factory where they were no different than the next person beside them who didn't have 40 years making tile. Because what was important at that point was not how good they were, it was how much time they could spend on the line. And in fact, some factory owners at that time we have documented, um, they would literally steal time they would sneak in and change the, the hands on the clocks so they could steal the time of their workers. And when you think about it that way, that this idea that time is money is a complete construct, and evolutionarily speaking, it's a very recent construct, it begins to make sense that when we are not working, it feels like we're wasting money. It feels like we can't afford to sit and watch a movie without also, also checking our email. And the more money you make, the more likely you are to believe that you can't afford to waste any time. Because of course your time is more valuable. It used to be <laughs> that people who were in the, the middle to the lower classes, they worked really, really long hours. Now, the lower your income, very often, the fewer hours you work and the most the most overscheduled people are the people at the highest end of the income scale. And here's the other thing, is that there's literally no reason to be working that hard when you're making that money. I mean, a good 25 years worth of research, good, solid, fact-checked, peer-reviewed research shows that if you make more than anything you make above, say, $78,000 a year, doesn't make you any happier and it doesn't make you any healthier. So we trade away our time checking Slack and email uh, at you know, 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, and it's not going to make us happier, and it doesn't make us healthier. So why? Why? Also, people who work excessive hours, that's like more than 50, 55 hours a week, only get on average about 6% more in salary. The thing of it is, this situation that we're in right now in which religion and capitalism and government have all conspired together, and I use the word conspire very intentionally, to make us believe that our worth depends on how hard we work, that was very intentional. That didn't happen by chance. 
And this is one of the things that I discovered as I started to pour through these, uh, let's be honest, incredibly boring texts <laughs> about work habits and work hours. I mean, honestly, I mean, you all owe me a debt of thanks because you, <laughs> you don't have to read about the labor hours of the Greek surf. Um, I don't recommend it. Uh, but this is what I found out. And one of the big, another big eye opener, frankly, this whole research was a, a just epiphany after epiphany, um, was that there, be, there rose this huge movement to limit our working hours during the day to eight hours. And it was global. In fact, it was a South American country that first instituted that as a, as, a, as a law. So there was this massive movement to limit our working hours to eight hours a day. And it took a very long time. People lost their lives. They put their lives on the line to earn us the eight hour day. And at that point, we still have the documentation showing that business owners said, okay, we've lost this. So what we're gonna do <laughs> is we're gonna choose another way to get people to stay longer. And they learned a really, really great lesson from some of the people who did covert operations and propaganda during World War I and World War II, and they realized we don't have to have a law saying you can work eight hours a day. If we convince people that good citizens and good people and good people who are going to heaven are the ones who work longer, if we can really drill in the Protestant work ethic, if we truly make people believe that you earn your position in life, that if you're unemployed, you deserve to be. You deserve to be poverty stricken. If we can convince people of that, we don't need the law. They will choose to work longer hours. And that is exactly what has happened. In fact, every generation since then has leaned into this. So much so that Americans on average donate over a trillion dollars to their employers every year by choosing not to take paid vacation time. I'm gonna repeat that. <laughs> this is only for Americans who have paid vacation time. And yet even among that number of people, we donate over a trillion dollars to our employers. You are giving them money, even though those who take all of their vacation time are double digits more likely to be promoted, double digits more likely to get a raise in salary. Okay, that is the end of my 10 minutes and we're gonna move to questions. <laughs> the last thing I will say as we go to questions is that we, I get a lot of resistance, especially from some of the older generations who really want to believe that anyone who complains about not succeeding is not working hard enough. And let me just tell you, the evidence doesn't support that. That's bunk. So, questions. Hello. I have two quick questions. Okay. What would you say to the person who says they love their job, they get fulfillment from their job, so working long hours is okay? And do you think a four day work week is inevitable? Okay, I love my job too. Um, but the thing of it is, is that uh, there is a, a, a law of diminishing returns when it comes to focus. The human brain can only focus for a certain number of hours a day. And for the average person, it's somewhere between three to five hours a day. That's all you got. Now, that's enough. Charles Dickens worked maybe four hours a day. Charles Darwin worked maybe four hours a day. Henri Poincaré. If you look at the people who are incredibly productive and accomplished through history, they worked on average about four hours a day. So working longer actually makes you less productive because you make way more errors, you're less innovative, you're less creative, and you end up just having to redo a bunch of work. So that's number one, stop working. You love your job, great, love it for a few hours a day. <laughs> second, what was the second question again? Four day work week. Um, we really should be working a two or three day work week. <laughs> Next question. Oh, next question. So I'm um, interested in a timely way in the way that do nothing speaks to or speaks against this quiet, 
quitting. Oh my God. Time, right? <laughs> um, what are you doing with it? What should we be doing with it? Uh, how did it become a thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a book festival. I'm, I'm not going to swear. Um, quiet quitting is crap. And again, this is just a manipulation. And it's mostly targeted to make, yet again, young people look like they're irresponsible. Quiet quitting is people establishing healthy boundaries. We, and it's not new. We have been talking about work-life balance for a very, very long time. And somebody saying, I'm gonna work only the hours you pay me for, that's not quitting. <laughs> that's working the hours you pay me for. And quiet quitting? Trying to make me feel guilty for establishing a work-life balance is ridiculous. Here's what I say to everybody. You need to treat yourself like you're the shop. What's your name? Shonda. Okay. If Shonda shop has hours, what, when does it open and when does it close? Right? When do you flip that thing to open, at which point you have done no work in the day before then, and when does that sign flip over to closed and then the shop is closed? <laughs> So quiet quitting. Thank you. Next. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm a workaholic. <laughs> and the, my question is, do you see this work workaholic going into our personal life workaholic? Like, I get home and I have to do these 25 different things. I can't sit in front of television. Yeah. If I'm sitting in front of television, I'm going, why aren't I doing these 25 other things? Do you see the two blending? Okay, so it's not you, it's us. That's all of us. Um, not just psychologists, but sociologists have noticed the tr this trend in so many different ways. For example, the size of our houses have grown in exponentially, so meaning that we're creating spaces to we can say inside more. Our yards have shrunk, right? Think about that for a moment, how much that affects our personal lives. Um, yes, of course you feel that way. And it is no surprise, and it makes perfect sense that when everything around you is telling you that somebody who is the, the idle hands of the devil's playground, um, that uh, you earn your way, that people are getting on Twitter in the morning and writing, rise and grind, <laughs> right? I mean, this idea that you're some kind of whetstone, you know, that, come on, of, that has been drilled into you. And it takes a really long time to break that. It take, it just like any other addiction. And it's, you know, originally I was going to call the book The Cult of Efficiency because I truly do believe it's a cult. And you have to be deprogrammed. So it takes a little time. Sorry. Yes. Um, you talk a lot about, like, how capital and jobs and, like, work hours and how executives want you to like work more. Mm -hmm. I'm personally a student and I have, I feel like the workaholic a lot, but I don't have necessarily the boss or the, like I'm not getting paid to be a student. So yeah. like how, how does that interact? Like is it just the, the culture more than just like the capital? <coughs> like why do students feel so under pressure to work so hard? So Gen Z has the highest levels of perfectionism ever recorded of any generation. Um, so much so that we have a, a lot of documented cases of uh, people in that generation being paralyzed by unable to begin trying work, doing some working on something because they're so afraid of making a mistake. Where does that come from? It doesn't matter if you're being paid for it. Our entire society has become focused on achievement, um, where you're not supposed to start baking unless you can have sourdough breads that are worthy of Instagram, <laughs> right? Um, you come home and you're like, oh, I don't have a, you know, I don't have to pick up my kids until three. I can make some quick curtains. Um, w and, but this is the same that is true for young people also. This is, we are the filter generation. It's never good enough. Um, and so I absolutely encourage young people to, in every aspect of your life, and actually I am going to swear, um, embrace Anne Lamott's paradigm of the shitty first draft. Just get it on paper, whatever it is. Just dump it out of yourself. That very first time you try something, don't edit. Don't filter, don't Photoshop, just embrace that as a life philosophy. Um, because 
you don't know what you're good at unless you try it and you find that you're good at it. But it, we find this very high levels of, of among students of perfectionism and defeatism and um, cynicism and depression. And we have our generations that have come before you have done that. <laughs> we have created a society in which what else are you to believe? That's the values of the people around you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next. Hi. Um, Hi. You, you hinted at it with your answer to that young woman's question, but I'm curious, intergenerationally, you know, family going, if there's any correlation down, you know, your father is a workaholic, parent is a workaholic, if there's any. Yeah, absolutely. If, is, is it intergeneration? Of course it is. Um, if that's the way, if the values of your parents are that, that hard work makes you a good person, then any child, when they're quite young, is going to want to earn the esteem of their parents by working hard, right? Um, I don't care if you're good at it as long as you do your best, right? Um, I'm okay with you doing your worst. Like, I'm okay with that. That's fine with me. Just, you're a child. Um, but yes, you are going to try to impress people and earn your place in people's affection. I mean, think about how ridiculous this is, that you're supposed to work hard enough to earn love or value like your value depends on how well you work do you know how many incredibly famous people like Sophocles just screwed around all day <laughs> I mean that the current value especially between parent and child of focusing on how you're using your time and making sure in fact the the helicopter parent phenomenon is a byproduct of this very value system, and that also we have the evidence now to show how very destructive that is. So, yes. Next. So, I have a question for you. I loved what you said about the conspiracy between government, religion, and capitalism. Yeah. I'm a sociocultural anthropologist, so we know there are lots of societies around the world that are not shackled by that trio. What do you think it's going to take for the U.S. and constituents in the U.S. to break? that trio of shackles? Um, it's going to take a form of revolution. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about at some point, you know, it's interesting. If you look at the um, major causes of burnout, if you look at the WHO and they have like four major causes of burnout, maybe five, literally none of them can be solved with self-care. Mm -hmm. Zero. Now, Things that you can do as an individual can help, and I document them in the book. But the other thing I say is this only goes so far, and at some point, we as a society have to stop shaming people and calling it quiet quitting and say, absolutely, I support this person's effort to establish healthy boundaries. And not only that, but I'm not only going to say that I want you to have um, work-life balance, but I'm not ever going to email a coworker after hours. What it's going to take that. What do you think will trigger the societal change? Um, I kind of feel like the millennials and Gen Z have had it. I feel like they've had enough. Um, and I, I have a lot of hope for the younger generation because I feel like they don't have any tolerance for it. And I say more power to them. I mean, I will support absolutely every single effort to avoid burnout by reclaiming your time. Reclaim your time. Hi. Hi. Uh, speaking of reclaiming my time, I quit my job and Friday was my last day. Wow. Congratulations. Um, that's a story for another time. I actually wanted to ask a similar question, and you're leading into that. The future of trends, or the, what's gonna, the future going to look like, especially with technology evolving so rapidly, automation coming into the workforce, how are those, that going to mix in, and where do you see the trends going? So I don't think either um, AI uh, technology or automation is going to automatically reduce the number of hours that we work. And I'll, I put it to you this way. Imagine a, a, a bookkeeper in 1970, and it took that bookkeeper, probably he, um, 40 hours a week, 45 hours a week to get his work done, right? That same bookkeeper can get that work done now in 12 hours a week, probably, with technology. And yet he's working now 50 hours a week. Why? 
why is he working 50 hours a week, right? It's because people have now added 14,000 meetings, probably. <laughs> and people are sending useless, unnecessary emails that they have to respond to. And we have inbox zero as some kind of value. Um, that's why. If, if we were all about just getting your work done and going home, we would all be working very few hours right now because we can get our work done now in a very short amount of time. So I don't think automation, there's always going to be resistance. For some reason, executives en masse still want to manage workforce as though it's 1850, as though how much time you spend with your butt in the office chair is how valuable you are as an employee. It's ridiculous. So I think that force, that habit to do things the way they have always been done is so strong, it's going to take real conscious, intentional change. Yeah. Hi, um, hey. my question is about unlimited paid time off and how that's becoming such a trend, especially amongst it seems like younger companies um, and how that's like fairly understood to be bad policy, especially for marginalized people and how that is impacting people across different spectrums. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and how it can be implemented like evenly and. I actually don't know the answer to that. And the reason is because is I haven't seen the research showing that that dis, um, disproportionately affects, impacts marginalized people. It doesn't surprise me because it seems like everything disproportionately impacts marginalized people. Um, so unlimited paid time off is kind of a weird concept, right? The, I didn't do that. I just said, look, you know, when I, with my producers, like on a radio show, I would say, this is your salary, regardless of how many hours you work. When you're done with your work, go home. I don't really care to see you. <laughs> so when you're finished, leave. And here's the thing. I had to force them to leave the building. I would literally have to go out there and I'd be like, it's four o'clock. Why are you here? Get up and get out. I would literally have to force them to leave the building. That's how powerful this impulse is to prove to me, even though I'm literally telling them I don't value your butt in the chair, they still feel like they're proving their worth to me by working long hours. So I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that, though I'm going to look it up. Um, but a pay, unlimited paid time off should just be go home when you're done. Hello. Hi. Um, well, I, um, um, it's really nice to hear the things that you're saying. I have a little question. Um, so I'm a research assistant. I'm mm -hmm. 24, and you know, research is uh, we work all the time, and it's yeah. Because when's research done? When is that job done? <laughs> exactly, and uh, it's it's actually like a really established path. And you know, it's like, I'm a research assistant, I need to go to grad school, I need to do a PhD, I need to do a ton of things before I kind of became someone in yeah. the industry. Uh, so sometimes I get the feeling that I'm behind all those things, especially when I'm resting, like I maybe I should be writing my own ideas, my own research ideas, my own like advancing work and everything because uh, most research people have their research projects for work, but also our own research projects. So yeah. it's like you're working all the time. And since I still feel that I have this long way to go, uh, I don't know uh, what to do with, our feel with that feeling, you know? Uh, what, what would you recommend? So there's two things here. One is that you're coming up against a reality, which is that um, Regardless of what I would like the world to look like, that's not the world we're living in. We're still living in a society in which working those long hours is what people demand of you. Um, I went to uh, my boss at one point, time, point in time and said, um, we need more people. My, my team is working 15, 16 hours a day. And she said, I did too. That's how you, were, that's how you earn your place. And I was like, hmm. um, not there anymore. <laughs> but that is... That is the current state of mind, especially among the executive class, and obviously among many academics. So you're again working against this reality in which, yes, people do expect you to work that hard to earn your place. And that's, sadly, at this point, what you're going to have to do. Um, on the other hand, this thing that you're talking about of this voice in your head, 
there's a couple things I want to tell you about here. That's a delusion, that voice in your head. And it's preventing you from actually being productive because we know that when you are, uh, does that mean 15 left? Okay, thank you. Um, so it's preventing you from being productive. It's actually preventing you from being innovative. In order for you to actually have the kind of um, ideas and make the new surprising neural connections that you need to be a great research assistant, you need to be rested. But you have been inculcated into this idea that waste, you're wasting time when you're resting. This is one of the reasons why the book is full of research, because I found it takes that much research to convince people. It's kind of like, you know those 3D pictures where you stare at them forever and then eventually you see the picture and then you can't unsee it? Yeah. I'm asking everybody to take the red pill. <laughs> And once you see it, you can't unsee it, but it, it, it takes a little while to turn that off. So I'm gonna, the advice I'm gonna give you is coming straight from the best knowledge that we have in psychology and sociology, which is that the, the, the quality that is gonna make you the most resilient is not self-esteem, it's self-compassion. Um, and when you hear that voice in your head, I want you to give that voice a name because that voice is not your friend. That voice is a critical, judgmental person. And I want you to imagine in your mind, it doesn't matter if it's a real person, just imagine in your mind the most nurturing and kind person you've ever known, right? And when that voice starts criticizing you for resting, I want you to let this other person respond to them. Because this is your best friend, right? And if it were your best friend that was like, I can't rest right now, I'm wasting my time, I'm a waste, I have so far to go, what are you doing? You're a failure. What would you say to your best friend? You'd say, you're tired. Sit down. Watch Parks and Rec. Eat some popcorn, <laughs> right? That's what you'd say to your best friend. So I want you to let that best friend respond to them. Thank you. You're welcome. You've been talking a lot about like salary and office workers. What would you say to somebody who, because I'm a nurse, so mm -hmm. obviously I have to work 12 hours. And sometimes it's three days a week, hopefully, because I'm a new nurse, so hopefully it'll stay three days for a while. Um, but what would you say to medical workers who actually have to take care of their patients? Because we are taking care of other people. So. Um, so a couple things. The American view of how many hours a, a, a medical worker is going to work is completely dysfunctional and it's leading to mistakes. Oh, yeah. um, we have really good solid research and I include at least a couple of them including one at a large hospital in Salgrenska in which they had an orthopedic unit that was so overwhelmed that they, it, people, patients had to wait months to get surgery. And they brought in a research team and they said, I wonder, what if we cut down everybody's hours down to a six hour shift a day? Yeah. <laughs> and um, they, they had hired all these people to fill in. They assumed they were gonna need people to, to, to fill in those hours and make sure everything got done. But in fact, that unit became so much more productive that without bringing in extra workers, they brought that wait time down to like 10 days. Probably less medical errors. So that is not the world you're living in. But I would say this, if you have to work 12 hour shifts, then you need to be extremely protective over the rest of your time. You need to start curating your phone. You need to make sure it's not giving you notifications unless it's absolutely necessary. You need to turn away from the screens as much as possible, not because I hate tech, but because we know neurologically speaking that that's incredibly stressful even when you have a screen in your peripheral vision, stressful to your cognitive processes. You need to make sure that that time when you are not at work is rest. And you are not responsible for what happens to your patients when you're not there. And no amount of working or checking your email inbox is going to make them healthier or prevent a downturn. You're welcome and thank you. Hi. Hello. For a certain um, segment of the workforce, hasn't the pandemic actually pushed us towards the vision that you have for the um, um, talking about? Um, especially if you're in like the office, like, like an office worker. Mm -hmm. like for instance, myself, 
Um, we are doing hybrid work now, and like I only have to be in two days a week in order to keep my office so that they don't hotel it out. So two days a week, I go in for three days a week, I'm home, and I get more productive at home because when I, there's no urgent emails between things that are more urgent, I can do the laundry or the dishes or whatever and have my entire evening free, my weekend free, while if I was at work, I would be sitting there all day, eight hours or seven and a half, and you, you know, just making work for myself and then go home and have to do all the housework and on the weekends, the housework and, or whatever. So I think that the, the pandemic for a certain segment of the, of the workforce has pushed us into what you're saying. And I've told my company, they've asked us to do surveys, that I'm actually more productive, more productive total person, not just a work person, but like work at home. Um, because of the kind of structure I now have in my life. So that is awesome that that's working for you. Um, I think the pandemic has made more and more people aware of how dysfunctional our habits leading up to the pandemic have been. Um, but we made mostly the wrong choices uh, in 2020. So much so that at this point, most people are not working from home, they're living at work. Um, here's the thing, if you have insomnia, right, the doctor will tell you do nothing in your bed except sleep. Don't check your phone, don't read, don't eat. You need to train your brain that the bed is for sleep because that's the way our brains work, right? We go into different environments and your brain will change its functioning in order to adapt. Most people have now picked up their laptops and taken it with them into the kitchen and into the bathroom and into the bedroom, obviously, and then they're like, I need a little sun. I'm gonna go do my work on the front step. Um, and they have allowed work to claim every part of their home. And that means that their brain is never not on alert. Even if you're not aware of it, you're on call 24 hours a day because your brain now accepts the home as a workplace. That doesn't mean you can't work remotely in a healthy way. You absolutely can, and I totally support remote or hybrid work, but it means you have to choose where in your house is the place for work. And when a call comes in, you go into that spot. You may feel like an idiot, but that's what you have to do. The call comes in, you say, hang on a moment. Yes? <laughs> and you don't pick up that laptop and take it with you in the bathroom, and you don't take it to the basement, and you don't take it anywhere else. There's a spot for work, and that's the spot. This is something that a, a New Zealand uh, think tank referred to as polluted time, meaning that our time has crossed the boundaries both ways. We, we are at work shopping for boots on Zappos and buying Christmas presents, but we're also working, we're at home. But the, the direction has mostly gone this way. And it is awesome that people are beginning to realize that our work habits were completely toxic, but we have to be more, we have to be smarter now about making sure that we recover from this rather than just being like, yay, they're allowing me to work from home. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm asking this, conscious that I am a cis white woman, but I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how diversity, especially for black people and black women in particular, who, you know, there's the whole idea that they have to work twice as hard to get half as much. Yeah, that's I'm wondering if you can speak to that and how that affects the reality of people being able to do their work. So regardless of how I look, I am a black Jewish woman. Uh, my grandfather was the dean of African American composers. Um, and uh, it's not just that there's the idea that w black women have to work twice as hard. That's just what the evidence says. Um, there's also some really good evidence showing that uh, black women in general don't want to go back to the office. Why? Because when they go into the office, they're subjected to so many microaggressions um, that the stress level just goes through the roof. So to a certain extent, remote work and hybrid work is a civil rights issue until we can get ourselves together and stop subjecting people to that kind of treatment in the office place, their home is the most comfortable and safe space for them. Um, so when we talk about work hours, absolutely we know, and it's not just, there's a whole chapter in the book that's about gender. Um, and the last line of that chapter is, lean out, ladies. 
because <laughs> because almost every aspect of work um, shows that it's not just women. For everything that I'm about to tell you about gender, you can just say it's worse for black women. Um, and of course, it's work, worse for almost most people of color and people who are differently abled as well. Let's just group this all together, those who are disadvantaged in, in one way or another. But even in gender, men are more likely to take lunches outside the office. They're more likely to take lunch, period. They're way less likely to get non-promotable work. So women ended up having to do much, much, much more work because they have added on all the non-promotable work, the stuff that is not of value when they do their performance reviews. This is true of, of black people as well. But here's the other thing. It's that when the people who are most likely to object to unfair and unjust treatment are people of color and women, they are also way more likely to be punished for it. The people who are least likely to object to unfair treatment are white dudes, and they are also the most likely to be rewarded for it. So there's a really easy solution here, right? Um, we just have to be aware of it. And again, it's like we're fighting against some really tough forces. This is one of the reasons why it's gonna take really concerted action where we all say, you know what, I don't want this treatment for myself and I don't want it for you either. I don't want you to be in this either. So let's make it just better for everybody. That's essentially what it's gonna take. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, good afternoon. An element that you've mentioned through your talk, from what I've heard, is that because of shame that we induce into people, we indoctrinate these destructive narratives into their head that we have to work 24-7. As a sociologist, how do you suggest that we encourage and educate people to have empathy for others? Because I feel that having empathy could be one of the solutions to pushing back against these destructive notions. Totally agree, although there is a limit to empathy. Um, and I say that being as someone who really pushes empathy. I am a pusher of empathy. On the other hand, we tend to have the most empathy for people who are the most similar to us. So empathy can actually make you biased in some ways. You won't feel empathy for people who are most different. And this is true in this case also. If you are a really hard worker and you valued hard work all your life, it might be very, very difficult for you to have empathy for someone that you think is lazy. Um, so that's why I would, I, I want to push compassion. And you know, it's interesting. Um, uh, let me put it to you this way. I'm going to tell you five words that I want you guys all to remember and try to use. Imagine that you have a huge pain in your knee. Like you've injured your knee somehow, um, but it's not debilitating and it, you have, it takes you like three months to get an appointment with the, the specialist doctor. And finally, you've been in pain this whole time, you finally, the appointment is coming up, it's like two days away and you get a call from his office saying, uh, we have to cancel and reschedule. And you're pissed, right? This is unfair. He's clearly not appreciating the pain that you're in. So a couple weeks later, you finally get in to see the doctor and you're ready to give him a piece of your mind and he says, you know what, thank you so much for rescheduling. The earthquake in Haiti happened and I rushed over there to help. Um, with the, pe the survivors that they were pulling out and I was helping in the children's hospital. <laughs> right, where'd your anger go? So this is when we talk about having empathy for others, I want you to remember these five words. What else could this mean? When someone behaves a certain way and we interpret it as them being a jerk or lazy or whatever it may be, what else could be going on? What are the other interpretations? We have one minute left, which is, I'm gonna answer a question super fast. Yes. So kids nowadays um, in public school, they have to work six, seven hours per week. Yeah, you mean in homework after school. And then that's, that's not including homework. And then they go home, they have two hours of homework. So that's eight to nine hours per day that they're working. What do you think about all of this? Uh, I think it's bad. Um, <laughs> So here's the thing, one of the things, one of the whole chapters is on evolutionary biology and psychology. Um, and one of the things I was trying to answer was, is work an inherent need? Does homo sapiens, does our species need to be, to work, 
to be healthy and experience well-being? And the answer is absolutely not. The number one need that we have after food, shelter, and water is belonging, community. And in fact, one of our inherent needs is play. That's an inherent need. Work isn't. So tell that to your teachers. <laughs> and then send them to me. Uh, I have to wrap up. Thank you all so very much.